Um, I think if you ask yourself and you're honest with yourself, you've been probably using integrated payments for about 10 years. Just yeah, maybe not for yourself. Or, exactly. Didn't even know it. Exactly. Okay, so we clearly see that this is a win-win, right? So just because you brought up the whole demo thing, which is fine. <laughs> well, 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 we'll start <laughs> thinking about lunch. Well, well, trust, right? me. Well, well, well trust me, I, pl I play a lot of golf with some of these younger members of the generation who don't carry cash. So I make sure I get paid if I win money, <laughs> if and when I'm, if, if and when I win money. And typically these days it's uh, a la Venmo, not cash. So ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Good yeah. to know. Yes. Normally it's just like the lunch transaction. That's yeah. pretty much where yeah, I pl am. Plus Venmo said they pay me 5,000 if I said that. No, oh, no, yeah? I'm, kid no I'm, I'm kidding. My new Say big thing is the Dunkin' Donuts times. app. The Dunkin' Say Donuts app, order your coffee, pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> Welcome everybody to today's Coffee Talk on the power of payment processing. It's Tanya Reese with you again here at Millennium Systems International. I am so excited to introduce you guys to some very special guests that we have with us. Today I have Matt Scudder, who's the COO of Millennium Systems International. He's been with the company for a little over 18 years. And fun fact, he was almost one of the very first employees here at Millennium. Almost. 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 <laughs> Don't say that out loud. Bob McConey will get a little upset about that. Bob, okay. I was the number one. I was uh, a short distance there afterwards. Short distance so, afterwards. Time. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to make sure that Bob's not watching this. Yeah. Make sure he's blacklisted from this. Okay. Shit. Perfect. Yeah. Also, I have Kristen Wallbacker with us. She is the Integrative Payments Director here at Millennium Systems International. She's actually worked with Integrative Payments for roughly a little over 15 years and actually has her own merchant company. So when it comes down to answering any of your questions, and we got tons of questions from the audience, so I can't wait, you guys will have all of your answers answered today. But as you know, before we get into the nitty gritty, I always like to ask the first question. How do you guys take your coffee? Well, uh, ladies first, so I'll let Chris in. Respond. Light and sweet, cream and sugar. Ooh. I'm actually an espresso guy. With, Fancy. Uh, with a with a couple lumps of sugar, but for this, uh, I, I would take my coffee light and sweet. Very nice, very mm. nice. Good, all right. So one of the questions that I know that I personally have, and I always like to do this when we start with coffee talks, is I kind of try to speak for the experience of you know, all the viewers watching, because we have hopefully our business owners, our managers on with us today. Um, being from the industry, one of the things that I personally struggled with, uh, with my 10 years of experience you know, working with salons and spas is one, I didn't really ever know anything about integrative payments, right? I didn't know about what was the best, what was the best terminals to buy. It kind of was that thing of this is what you get. This is the rate done. So can you explain to everybody out there exactly what is integrative payments? What is it? Integrated Payments is the division of our company that works with our clients to set up credit card processing that's efficient for our clients. So it communicates with our software versus a side terminal on the side of the POS system where you're doing a lot of double data entry. So we work with our clients to make sure that they're processing both efficiently, cost effectively, and what's easiest for their business. Got it. So why would you say that it's so important to ha have integrated payments in the business? We know what it is, but why is it so important? Well, I think that's uh, <clears throat> it's a very good question. Um, I think it really comes down to um, efficiency, right? At the end of the day, it's cost of doing business to accept credit cards, right? It doesn't matter what type of business that you are. You're going to accept cash, check, and other forms of credit cards, right? But at the end of the day, to Kristen's point, there is a, a tremendous impact and a lot of operational efficiency that can be improved by kind of cutting out what's disconnected. So if you think about it, it's really the intangibles, right? Uh, a lot of people kind of look at, to your point, what's the cost of the machine? What are my fees? But they don't look at the intangibles of, if it's not external and it's integrated, what's the value of using a card on file for, somebody's in, for somebody that's standing in line? 
What's the value of being able to bill on a recurring basis? What is the value of not having to swipe here and then potentially select the wrong form of payment in our software? And then when you're reconciling at the end of the night, you got to kind of mix and match and find out where that clerical mistake was, right? So I think for me, it really comes down to operational efficiency. Perfect. So what would you say then is the one most overlooked area when it comes to integrative payments? Simply put, uh, knowledge. Okay. So I like to put myself in the customer's shoes, right? And I think the customers, our customers, they have an obligation to themselves, not just to stay diligent and make sure they're keeping an eye on the financials, right? But understand what type of pricing model or business model that they have, right? That'll help them instill some best practices to mitigate some of those fees, right? But if I'm a, I'm going to spitball here, right? But if I'm a, a salon and spa and I have a See, I have some medical procedures that I do on a recurring basis, right? Okay, Millenn- like a membership? Exactly. Okay. Well, Millennium and Mevo 2, they both have the ability to not only process right now up front, but on a recurring basis. So, but in the credit card processing world, there's a distinction there. If you're giving me your credit card, that is what they call a card present transaction because the customer is present. If I take your credit card on file and I store it on file and let's say for uh, this series or this expensive cosmetic service I got done, I'm gonna pay over six months, that's called a uh, card not present, but there are associated fees that go with each because the risk potential differs in both situations. So I think for me, it's just knowledge and I would recommend that any business or any owner that's watching right now, just take a, a, a self-interest. If you're not, I'm not saying you are or you're not, but I'm saying, Dig a little bit deeper because there's a lot of misnomers out there. And I'm going to showcase one and give you guys one example, right? There's a misnomer that debit processing is cheaper than credit processing. Isn't it? Yes and no. And and I'm going to put it as simply as I can. Round numbers. Let's take a $100 transaction, okay? If you're running as a credit, you pay 2%. If you run it as a debit, you pay 30 cents. So with that $100 transaction, 2% would be what? $2. If I run it as a debit, it would be what? 30 cents. Mm-hmm. Debit in that case is less expensive. Now let's slash a zero. $10 charge. 2% of a $10 charge would be 20 cents. Running it as a debit would be 30 cents. So it's more expensive. So it's more expensive at that case. So that's just one example of many but even if you just showcase that one example at some point in time there's uh there's an equilibrium points where it doesn't matter if you run it as a debit or a credit the fee is going to be the same but what could you do as a business to help mitigate and control some of those fees well if you identify that that equilibrium point is 65 dollars any transaction that's being processed less than 65 you do it as a credit anything higher as a debit so that would be one piece of advice is obtaining a little bit more of a fundamental knowledge of what you offer how you process and then how those rates apply got it so just based off of the example that you provided for us i know that um you know whether you have millennium or if you have mevo you know we have different things or different metrics that can be evaluated in the software so that would be considered average ticket right so when i'm calling in or potentially talking to your department, I should have a really good idea of then what my average ticket is, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what would you say then, Kristen, is one of the biggest pain points, because a lot of the calls are coming to you, right? Whether it's specifically for our clients or maybe calls coming into our sales team of people that potentially are looking to either onboard with Millennium or with Mevo, hopefully it's Mevo, right? Um, but what are some of the pain points or the questions that you're really getting from clients that hopefully will help everybody watching today? I think there's a misconception that uh, clients come into where their their questions are always around rates and fees. Uh, a big pain point also is when working with a software and working with a separate processor, you have two different companies you're dealing with all the time. 
So if there's some type, if some type of issue happens or you have a question, you never know, do I call my software provider or do I call my processor? Uh, you call your processor, you could sit on hold. I mean, we've all called an 800 number before and sat on hold for 20 minutes or longer. Um, and exactly then they, they may say, well, you know what? We're not sure. It sounds like it's a software issue. And then you're calling back the software company. Our division works with our clients on both sides. So we build a relationship. We help them set up their payment processing and we also service it. So the integrated team works with our clients consistently to help mitigate any service, any questions, any rate related questions, service related, equipment related. So it really does take that freedom give it, and gives it back to the owner so that they can be free to run their business. And we can go ahead and use our relationships with our partners to get answers <clears throat> to questions, solve any problems that might be going on. But you, know, but you know, it's a good point about that, though, is the relationship that we have with our partners, right? If I'm Jane and John Doe merchant, Jane and John Doe salon and spa, mm -hmm. right? And I have an issue or I'm just not happy, like they can leverage us, right? Because we have a lot of pool with our partners that we offer. So I feel like one thing that's just really undervalued is, listen, we've vetted probably well over 15 to 20 different partnerships out there. Oh, wow. And it's not as easy as us just saying, hey, I use X, Y, and Z. Why can't we integrate with them? Or I use uh, Joe's Merchant Services. Why can't we use them? There's a lot of uh, diligence behind the scenes. And when we actually went down the path earlier this year, because we wanted to offer choice, right? In Millennium, uh, we had one partner, which was originally Element Payment Services, but then there was some consolidation in the market and they got scooped up by uh, Vanta, which is now WorldPay. But a lot of the um, inquiries we had was, uh, can we have another option? And so what we decided to do with Mevo2 is introduce a new company, Card Connect, which is a subsidiary of First Data Merchant Services. But to WorldPay's defense and Card Connect's defense, they are, not necessarily in this order, the best technology stacks that we've looked at from a fully integrated perspective. And the best way that I can describe that is that it offers all the things that we need to ensure that our application, Millennium or Mevo, helps to ensure that you're processing credit cards in the safest environment possible. And a lot of those other companies don't offer that. And it's really hard to explain sometimes that if we could offer 15 companies, we would. But there's certain requirements that we have and things that we need to do to allow us to empower our customers and give them the ability to do recurring billing and store credit cards on file. But a lot of these other companies can't provide the technology in order for us to be able to offer that to the audience. Got it. So yeah. we're looking out for our clients, most importantly. Yeah, I, I would like to think that we do. There you go. Yeah. Right? Nice and yeah. simple. So let me ask you this then, right? With us having all these different partners now that we may have, you know, we have some choices now that we're moving over to Mevo 2 and so forth, right? And for our clients that have had Millennium, now if I'm calling in and I'm wanting to make this change, what are the questions that I should be calling in and asking your team? I think it's important to understand compliance, to ask the questions about compliance. Yeah. Uh, for our what owner, is Let me stop you right there, right? If I was the person that worked in the salon <laughs> and you said, no, you're compliant, what is compliance? <laughs> what, what is this? Work, work with me here, like, right? What does that mean? Because we don't have managers on here that are gonna say, um, my boss told me to watch this. I don't know what this is, right? So break it down for me. Can I, uh, can I Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I, I think one of the questions uh, that should be asked along that lines is why should I have to worry about it, right? Yeah. They have a million, like, and we get it, you guys have a million things to worry about, especially those that are owner operator, right? You gotta run the business, you gotta market, you gotta drive business, you gotta kinda develop your team and perform. And the last thing you wanna hear about is compliance and what do I need to do, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, compliance, uh, the point I wanted to make was, again, getting back to the partnerships that we've aligned or the partners that we've aligned with, we have selected them specifically due to the technology they provide to allow us to at least provide what they call a PA DSS certified application. PA stands for a payment application. Millennium and Mevo in its rarest form is a payment application. You process transactions through it. But what do we do and what have we done? And, and, and we have learned along the way, this didn't happen overnight. But what we provide to our customers is that we provide them a point-to-point -point encrypted environment and Millennium, well, at least Mevo, moving forward, is what they would consider 
out of scope. So out of scope means that we are not subjected to any PCI standards because of the manner in which we empower you to process credit cards through the system. Okay, that doesn't mean that you're not PCI compliant. That's another animal because you have internet and firewall and employee fraud. You know, there are other safeguards that you have to do to protect yourself, but from a purely payment application perspective, mm -hmm. Millennium or Mevo, we have done our due diligence and we continue to do our due diligence to ensure that they have the safest uh, environment possible when processing transactions. So I guess my question is, why should they really care? Uh, they shouldn't really care, but they should care and understand what level they are in the processing world. They're a small to medium business, right? They're not the Home Depots of the world. They're not the Walmarts of the world. They don't have millions of dollars invested in infrastructure and staff to actually go through all the compliance and regulation. And that's why they see some of these compliance fees on their statements through WorldPay or Card Connect or some of these other providers because they know that this sector, I don't wanna say it takes it serious, but may not have the resources to get that done, right? So what they do is they align themselves with what they call a uh, Qualified Security Assessor, QSA. And in the WorldPay world, I believe it's through Tr Tr TrustWave under a program called OmniShield Assure, but that's a company that they have aligned with to actually handle some of those other items that we aren't necessarily responsible for. They should feel good and feel very good that what they're processing through is the safest environment possible. But does that protect them from their internet or firewall or, or employee stuff? Not necessarily. And that's why TrustWave, who is a partner of one of our integrated payment partners, uh, provides those services for them. So I guess in a long-winded fashion, should they care? Yes, but they should also know that we're doing our due diligence to at least provide them the resources, a la WorldPay, a la Car Connect, to help dispel some of those uh, fears or anxieties surrounding that issue. And that goes back also to what Matt mentioned before, which is that we really have vetted out the two partners that we work with, because not every partner provides all these safety mechanisms and all and partners with some of the best in the business. And that again comes down to why we selected the two that we work with today. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So what other questions should they be asking when they're calling into your team? So I know we're safe, right? Well, I think that uh, our mm -hmm. merchants just <laughs> definitely know some information about their business when they are shopping around for rates or they're calling in. They should understand that, that their monthly volume that they do as a business, their average ticket, as we mentioned before, uh, understand there's different pricing models and what they're in now and if that's what makes sense for their business. It's actually, uh, do I have coffee, coffee here? Do I make it here? We did make it here. You <laughs> like that? It is actually. Is awesome. It, Starbucks. Starbucks. So you to she's me, got a new she, responsibility. She, she, she's got to show me her secret, <laughs> I think. So awesome. It's actually very good. Very good. So what would you say then um, should the viewers be doing today that will help impact their rates? Right. I'm going to call in. I'm going to ask the right questions. I know that Millennium has my back. They're going to protect me. I'm completely compliant. What can I do today as a manager or a salon owner to impact my rates? There's definitely operational things that you can do aside from just the rate that your processor quotes you. And that really does depend on their business model. Matt mentioned before pre card present versus non-present environments. There's certain information you can collect in a card not present transaction that'll help drive those costs down a little bit. Got it. There was actually something that you mentioned to me, something that I didn't know about, which I, I don't know if this would fit into this, but when we had spoken prior to today, you had mentioned that if I collect a zip code when I'm doing a credit card transaction, that there's some type of fee that's associated or it lowers my fee. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So I feel like there's a lot. I didn't know this when I worked in my salon. Well, it's, well, it's, uh, that helps you get a more qualified rates because you have more points of uh, symmetry between the card holder and the transaction that's going through, right? So you have a signature, maybe a PIN number, but a zip code also helps substantiate the billing information for the card, right? But that's more prevalent, I would say, in the uh, card not present uh, environment. So any any business out there that's doing a recurring billing or doing some type of recurring billing, 
it's important for them to capture that information. But again, what I would say is over the years, we've gotten better. And uh, some of those little nuances that can help mitigate some of those fees, we actually build logically into the system. So, and I'll showcase it. Millennium, uh, if you have a recurring billing model, you would probably have to manually store the zip code on file before the information is sent, and then the card is processed at its regular cadence, right? In Mevo, we worked with our partners to identify how can we get our customers a better qualified rate? Because right now it's, it's user error driven. Like we're expecting and requiring somebody at the front desk who has a million things going on to remember to put a zip code that's not mandatory in the first place. So what did we do at Mevo? Through our extensive knowledge in the industry and some of those pain points and listening to our customers, we decided that now when we store a credit card on file, not only are we gonna send that information, but we're gonna look at the customer account. And if there's a zip code there, we're automatically gonna send it up. So some of those things, again, we can do on behalf of the customer, but again, I think, uh, my best advice to the audience would just be to stay on top of your rates, stay on top of, you know, your, your inline reporting uh, to see if there are adjustments there. But I think if you understand what you're processing and how you're processing it, in the example that I gave earlier, I think there are things operationally they can do to help mitigate some of those costs. So it's just, it's kind of having a renewed sense of focus on the volume that they do. And don't underestimate that. If they do substantial volume, that is leverage, right? They can use that as leverage when they're negotiating. So that would be my advice. So let me ask you this. If I'm currently in a contract with another company, um, and I just know this from experience, you know, being able to go out to different locations because for Millennium, right? If I go out to a business, some of them are not set up where they have the devices or the, what we would suggest, right? So if I currently have something and do I have the ability to shop around? Can I make that change? If so, when, how, what would that process be like for me? So those are all things that my team discuss on the phone whenever we speak with a client because some of that information we have to collect from their existing company. Sure. Uh, you know, we work our best to get the most competitive rates. So often uh, someone may find out that the amount of savings they're making may break them even in three months to whatever contract they may ha be in now. Some of them are out of contract and don't even know that. Some of them don't even have, never had a contract to begin with. It really largely varies, but we work with our clients the best that we can to steer them in getting that information yeah. from their provider if we don't already have the information and then helping them make an educated decision on what's best for their business. My, my, my advice would be try to stay away from the, the long-term commitment, you know, because uh, you never know what's going to come up around the corner, right? You never know where your business strategy is going to take you a year from now, it could be a new software system, right? That may not work with your current provider, right? So I would try to stay away from any type of long-term commitment. And I would also take a look at the fine line print where it references uh, liquidated damages. And the best way I can explain that is um, if the processing company is accustomed to making, making earning um, $300 a month and you're in a three-year deal, and you try to cancel it on month 13, they'll try to say, well, you're gonna owe us $300 for the remaining 24 months for early termination. So I would definitely try to take a look at that, but definitely read the contract, try to stay away from any long-term commitments or try to negotiate that, and definitely, definitely take a look at any clauses or provisions surrounding liquidated damages, especially if you're a high volume place. I mean, it's all relative, right? <laughs> the yeah. more you do, the higher the liquidated damages are going to go. And that's kind of where the industry is trending towards, which is unfortunate. But again, I don't think it's anything that uh, somebody can't negotiate if they fundamentally understand their business a little bit better. So, that's And ask advice. the questions. I mean, every owner, manager who's speaking with a potential processing company or partner should be asking the questions. And if, the, if they're not willing to answer the questions directly, that's a red flag right there. Uh, my team answers every, direct, every question directly. We know both our partners, we know the answers to the questions, uh, and we know our contracts. We know what we're putting out there. But it just makes sense, right? Integrated payments, it just makes sense. And uh, we are happy to provide choice, but if you think about it, and where, not just the industry, but the world is taking us, right? 
Think about your phones, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Integrated payments via virtual wallet, right? How many people use PayPal? How many people use Venmo, Venmo. right? How many people have cards stored on file to buy things from the App Store or the Google Store, right? I mean, all that is a form of integrated payments. So why would you want to process externally just to cause yourself some administrative overhead, potentially have clerical mistakes, and just uh, not really conform to the functionality of the system? I mean, listen, if Mevo at the end of the day, in one month, three months, five months, right, provides a, a way to process e-commerce so we come out with a store, I'm not saying we are. I'm just saying that would if, be exciting. It would be very exciting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my head's so already we'll, spitting. We'll all the things that. I would do if we'll, I was still we'll, in the we'll, salon or spa. We'll <laughs> leave it at that. But even with online booking and requiring a credit card on file for online booking, what if we come up with a consumer app where you like to check in, book appointments, but now you want to buy gift certificates and all that other stuff? How do you possibly? How can the consumer buy something if you're not using an integrated solution? It's not possible. So the point being is, while we still allow that flexibility to process externally, at some point in time, you're going to be negating functionality that could really enhance not just how you operate within the four walls, but how your consumers interact with your business and what you can offer to them. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So um, I think if you ask yourself and you're honest with yourself, you've been probably using integrated payments for about 10 years, just yeah, maybe not for yourself for it. Exactly. Didn't even know it. Exactly. Okay, so we clearly see that this is a win-win, right? So, just because you brought up the whole Venmo thing, just saying. <laughs> well, 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 Start well, thinking about lunch. Well, well trust right? me. Well, 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 trust me. I play. I play a lot of golf with some of these younger members of the generation who don't carry cash. So I make sure I get paid if I win money. Another. If and when I'm if if and when I win money. And typically these days, it's uh, a la Venmo, not cash. So, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Good yeah. to know. Yes. Normally, it's just like the lunch transaction. That's yeah. pretty much where yeah, I am. Yeah. Plus, Venmo said so they pay me 5000 if I said that. No. Oh, no, yeah? I'm kidding. No, I'm, I'm kidding. My I'm new big thing is the Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> app. The Dunkin' Say Donuts app, order your coffee, pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> so now that we kind of have a really good understanding of what integrative payments is, what you guys are able to offer, I know that you had mentioned it a little bit before, but... If you could recap for me or even tell me something, another company, whoever it may be, who can we partner with? Who are the partners that we're going to be partnering with? Who are the people that we should be looking out for? If I'm watching today, who could I start researching so that I can call Kristen's team? Who are these people? Sure. I'll let Kristen know. That's that one. Right now, we partner with Vanov, which is now under the name of WorldPay, and Card Connect as well. Those are the two partners that we've selected based on technology. Uh, what they offer our clients, the safety and security and compliance and taking a lot of that off the owner's plate. So those are our two valued partners right now. Yeah. So Millennium was always siloed to uh, Element, Vantive, WorldPay, and so forth. <clears throat> but we are very happy to introduce another partner via Car Connect for Mevo2. Uh, I don't know what the road looks like ahead. Um, but is there a potential to introduce other partnerships if it makes sense? But I will tell you, and I will reiterate what I said earlier. We did, and I will look everybody in the face, 100% <laughs> on my heart. We looked at well over 20 different companies. And I could spitball and rattle them off one by one if I had to right now. And it really comes down to which partnership is somewhat at the cutting edge of technology to give us what we need so that we can give you what you need. And again, not necessarily in that order, WorldPay and Car Connect had the two best technology stacks that we saw. And we feel very good about both those partnerships. And we'll continue to listen to our customers, hear what people are interested in. But it really comes down to, can they provide us with what we need? But we will, we will stay diligent and maybe potentially on the horizon, there may be another option. But as of right now, it's just those two. Perfect. So that was actually a question from our audience. So whoever's watching that asked that question, thank you very much, right? So hopefully they got the answer they were looking for. Um, we have another question that actually came in from our audience that said, what are the best practices for accepting credit card payments over the phone? I know that we covered this a little bit, but just so that if we can go over it again for them, um, it was mentioned in another question, but just that, to directly That does bring up one. the point of the zip code that you mentioned before. So in 
Mevo, it has the ability to pull the, the zip code from file, but often if they're taking a card over the phone, they may be, uh, want to be wanting to collect some of those additional, additional information. And that's all a matter of how it's set up. So it can go as, as far as zip code, street number, a lot of different additional pieces of information. I'm making, I'm making an assumption that that question came in because maybe it's a reservation policy. Right? Yeah, very well could be because, you know, somebody's Father's call- Day is coming up. Somebody's calling in. I got a 24-hour cancellation policy. You don't have a credit card on file and so forth, right? I think there are two pieces to that. Number one is security. How securely am I entering that information into the system? And then number two, how does it affect the fees, right? Well, I can tell you right now, uh, again, depending on what they're using. In the Mevo 2 world, maybe even in the Millennium world, if they're entering the data in, I would say that there's a very good chance that they are entering the data in through an encrypted device. So securely, they're handling that very well. At the end of the day, you're entering information into the system that is not swiped, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you do not swipe a credit card, you automatically lower your qualification if you ever process that card moving forward. So uh, a little bit of a hairy question there um and then of course you have the 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 x factor which is the staff member right who's actually writing the information down i mean you can't really do anything about that if we're talking about theft prevention or fraud prevention right so i guess there's really three things but you can't really it's going to happen one way or the other if you have a rogue employee security wise i think we've given you everything you need to feel comfortable that um the data is being entered in properly, but the fees, I don't think there's anything that they can do when they're entering a credit card that's not swiped. And Kristen can keep me honest, but I believe manually entering or manually keying credit card information drops you at a, uh, a lower rate. And so, so I'm not sure if that answers uh, the question out there in the audience or not, but, uh, but what I get back to also is if you're storing those credit cards on file, right? Mm-hmm. And now I walk in, right? Or that person cancels, right? Yeah. That's money you may not have had because you weren't able to fill that reservation last minute. And maybe you adhere to your reservation policy and you collect 15%, 20%, 30%, whatever that policy is. Mm -hmm. Was that worth paying an extra 0.5% because it was not qualified? I would say so. And then maybe even- Looking at it that way, yes. Exactly. But again, it's a give and take. But also moving forward, if that customer ever comes in and says, oh, hey, Chris and I have a carnal file. You want me to use that? And then you just insert that into the point of sale and you process it. From a convenience perspective, is that worth paying an extra 5% or 0.05%, whatever that is? Those are things that they have to take into consideration. And it's a, it's a purely business decision at that point. Well, I mean, I think it's even just good to know because personally, when I worked in the massage place that I, the spa that I worked at initially first, um, we were a membership based location. And as soon as we collected that credit card for the membership and we used Millennium at this particular location, it was just obviously, like you said, for a convenience factor, it was just easier for me to say, did you want to use the card on file? Of course. I wasn't educated to know any better. I just did this because it was convenient. And then when I became a manager said, Hey, do this, this is what I was taught. You do it too. But if the client had the credit card in hand, Right, that might have been a different thing. So even just mentioning that might be helpful because I didn't know that, right? When I was in the industry, I didn't know any better. So it takes two seconds sometimes to just ask somebody for a card versus where, yeah, maybe if it is for convenience, great. Right? Yeah, but you yeah. might have that business owner that might say, just great. ask. Yeah. Right. But again, that's getting back to at the beginning. What should people do? They should have a renewed focus on understanding the fundamentals, right? So yeah. in that situation... I take credit cards at the counter, so I have card present transactions. I take cards over the phone, so I have non-swiped, less qualified potential, which may raise my fees, Mm -hmm. right? But if they don't, they they have to at least have an understanding of those types of situations and how those fees are impacted based off those situations. So, yeah, very important, very important. So we have another question that came in from the audience, and this question says, Lately, I've heard that business owners are talking about making changes to guest with their credit card processing fees. And there is a processor that has this 
they want to know what's the initial idea about one changing that credit card fee for new guests and is this a new trend and is it legal oh that's the uh the cash discount surcharging yeah yeah that's reminds, well, uh, this, is all you. this is all you I, I think that's like gas station pricing so but that's, you know. uh what they're referring to is either cash discounting or surcharging and there's there are two different programs one is legal in uh, most states, one is only legal in about 40% of states. It's really dependent on the language that they choose to put at the sign by their register because that is a requirement of it. Um, but uh, I, personally, I don't recommend this program for our space because we this is an industry where we largely depend on repeat business. That's what it's all about is building the client base, having them come back over and over and over again. That's why we store cards. That's why we do so many things in this industry. Uh, this program is essentially taking the credit card fees that the business owner pays and passing them on to the customer. So the customer is being surcharged an extra fee for using a credit card versus paying cash. Uh, it can oh. create a, a negative experience for a client. I mean, it's been successful in resort areas, uh, certain industries where repeat customers isn't necessarily you know, needed, like a gas station. If you're a busy gas station on the corner of an intersection, it doesn't matter if I go there tomorrow and get my gas and say, oh, that was too expensive. I'm not going back. There's 5 million other people who are going to pass that corner in Poland that need gas. But for the salon, spa space, uh, where repeat business is a must, I don't recommend it. I uh, Just my opinion on that is teach their own, <laughs> right? Yeah. Teach their own. Um, I still just stand firm that processing credit cards is uh, and the fees associated with or just the cost of doing business, right? And again, there are ways for you to mitigate some of those costs. And for me, it's just, it's a very awkward conversation when you're questioned about it, right? If I go in and I get a, a haircut and it's $30 and you charge me 5%, so now I'm paying thirty-one fifty, and I'm like, I thought my haircut was $30. Like, oh, well, that dollar fifty is because uh, is you pay by credit card. Like, I, I would probably be turned off a little bit. But again, like I said, to each their own, um, I... I I would rather see, I understand it, but I would rather people, uh, instead of just looking at the fine line, well, how can I get this number down and passing that cost on? I would rather see them improve the manner in which they operate and improve their efficiency and try to cut those costs down by doing what makes sense. Again, in the example that I get with the uh, example I gave with the debit and credit earlier, right? I yeah. identify that as a potential and see if you start to see a, a little bit of a decline in those fees. Versus doing that as a last resort. I just, uh, that's my personal opinion on it. Uh, again, professionally, everybody in the audience can do what they feel is uh, in the best interest for their business. I'm just giving them a, a very unbiased opinion. And if I put myself in their shoes, it, it would probably not be a practice that I would do. Got so it. that doesn't mean that I know what I'm doing, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's, just, what, that's just what I would do. And just, just, an just, honest, just an honest answer. So. So another question that we have that came in from the audience is, what is the best practice for accepting credit card? Oh, well, we did that one. Sorry. Uh, why does Millennium not offer multiple credit card processing companies other than Vantiv for their users? We covered this a little bit, but we can talk about it again. The way credit card processing companies list their fees vary, and they can be super overwhelming and difficult to compare apples to apples. What tips do you give so that I am able to compare my credit card company rates? Well, we actually do have an analysis we uh, provide to each client if they do provide the statement, which we highly suggest because knowing how the business operates, what type of transactions they're taking, the types of cards that are coming in, all those pieces of information we collect off a statement. It's what gives us the education to recommend the best solutions, best rates, operational changes. Uh, we will take that and kind of compare it apples to apples to what we're offering so that uh, a merchant can, can see whether it's a one pricing table to another, the same pricing table to the same pricing table, they can kind of see an example of, all right, this month that I provided, this would have been the difference in the rates. So or I the can literally cost. give you one of my statements if I called in. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They'll do a, they'll do an assessment and actually show you because that's where it gets tricky, right? I mean, listen, <laughs> we're talking about credit card processing and we understand the value of it. And it's a very competitive space. And at the same time, there's there's ways to manipulate the numbers to uh, showcase that there may be savings, but there may not be savings. And I'm not saying that that's how we, that's not what our practice is, but I'm saying there, you know, I, I think sometimes the industry gets a little bit of a, a bad riff sure. because uh, they showcase, hey, here's certain savings, 
that people respond to because that's what their focus is. Uh, but then come to find out those savings weren't really that substantial, right? Because there's a way to manipulate the numbers well, with- It's a perfect example you know. of, we mentioned before, a qualified rate. So often our yeah. cli clients will be offered a fantastic qualified rate. It looks like it's too good to be true. It's half of what they're paying. But the qualified rate doesn't take into account every item, every line item on a statement where maybe it was a card not present, maybe it was a stored card, maybe it was a more expensive card type. These are things that the business owner cannot control that directly impact the rate, and it'll buck. It could take the. It could take seventy percent of your transactions and kick them out of a qualified bucket and into a non-qualified bucket, which could be double what that what's been pitched. Mm -hmm. And in that scenario, that's yeah. where you would say, like, what was showcased is not the end of the day reality. Yeah. I mean, I w we as a company at Emmett, do we have a lot of time left or now? We have a lot of time. Okay. Um, I think it's important, again, just to revisit the, the value proposition of efficiency, right? Costs are costs. There are things you can do to mitigate the costs. But again, it's really the intangibles that you have to really give substantial consideration to. To empower the experience of the customer, cut down the, the, the lines at the front desk, use a credit card on file, do recurring billing, consumer app, e com all that stuff is kind of tied directly to integrated payments. But what I want the audience to know is I'm going to tell them a quick story about us as uh, a company. So MSI, about four years ago, when we moved into our, our new building here in Parsippany, we were using a myriad of different homegrown programs to run our business, right? To sell, to quote, to support. Uh, I mean, it was just all over the place. And we were experiencing growth. And the problem was that the bigger you get, the more controls you need in place, right? Some people like to call that red tape, right? Mm -hmm. But from an accounting perspective, right? We couldn't have order forms with credit card information lying on the table and the cleaning crew having access to them and every Jane and John Doe employee, mm -hmm. right? So what we did is we said, listen, I think it's time that we have to invest in our infrastructure, right? And at that time, uh, the manner in which we were processing transactions, we had a very, very good rate, very, very good rate, right? Uh, so what we did was we went down this, uh, we, we went through a very formal RFI process and started looking at a new CRM system. Long story short, we actually selected Microsoft Dynamics because up until that point, we had been predominantly a Microsoft shop. And we're using Skype and Office um, and SharePoint. And obviously, a lot of our technology that we use with Millennium was, uh, was Microsoft or of Microsoft orientation. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we gave a verbal. Thank goodness we didn't sign anything. But we started to go down the path and we started to get into the, the sales cycle, right? Like, how does somebody sell and how do they quote? Uh, and ultimately, how do we capture the credit card information on file? And literally, they brought in a third party that was showing us this. And we're just like, so we're going from external to external. And so we, er, we kind of pumped the brakes and then we spun up a new RFI for a billing system. And the billing system RFI led us down a path of looking at Salesforce, which we did originally, but looking at it a little bit more thoroughly because all the billing systems that did what we wanted it to do integrated with Salesforce only. So long story short, we paused the CRM, we introduced a new billing system, which had a much higher rate, a much, much higher rate, but served as a foundation for us to move our operation to Salesforce, okay? So what we did was we, uh, again, we looked at how can we be more efficient and what did we have to give up to be more efficient? We gave up fees credit card fees, processing fees, to be more efficient, to have a solution that made us within these four walls more operationally sound, right? And since then, we've been able to integrate the CRM with our Mevo products. We've been able to introduce a, a learning management system that people can use, right? Once mm -hmm. we add you into our system, you're able to go into our learning management system. You can now log into our community site, but all that spawned from us looking at efficiency versus rates because i can tell you when we switched our processing company uh we definitely sacrificed a little bit but for what for overall operational 
efficiency improvement. And hopefully our customers are going to be experiencing that through the myriad of different programs we are now able to provide them through that learning management system and through our community site and just really cool notifications we're going to be able to push down to them through the Mevo 2 application. So, so very good business decision, but I think it showcases, is it cost or is it efficiency? And I think that is the epitome of the latter, not, not necessarily cost. So Got it. So let me ask you this then, right? This is one question I love to use to kind of help us always wrap up a coffee talk. What are the three main things that everybody watching today should take back with them? Three most important things, not four. You want a seesaw? Three. Seesaw. You, seesaw? Okay, go ahead. you can go first. Um, <laughs> understand your, your processing. Understand your business. Understand the your volume, your average ticket, and where you are in that space. Can I go for two? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would be number oh, one. Coffee, number two, so you're in. efficiency. <laughs> efficiency is the most important part, uh, in my personal opinion, of integrated payments. At the end of the day, we can talk pennies, dimes, cents all day long when it comes to looking at statements, looking at rates. You know, We can race to the floor. At the end of the day, what being integrated does for your business, does for your clients, does for efficiency, for reporting, for ease of use, convenience, even marketing at some point when you get into the e-com and the online booking side of it, that is truly going to help you grow your business at the end of the day. Want to add something? Was that three or two? That was two. That was two. That was two? That was two. That was two. <laughs> I'm looking for yeah. one more. <clears throat> I stole that one. I know he wants to go Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, just say, uh, don't wait until you file your taxes to realize how much you may or may not have been paying in credit card fees, right? Like mm -hmm. try to, Listen, you, you got to close out the month every month, right? This is true. So uh, just try to stay on top of it a little bit better and try to identify a problem that exists before it becomes an epidemic. That's my, uh, that's my suggestion. So it takes a couple minutes. It just takes a couple minutes just taking a look at what that bank statement is, right? right? Or your reconciliation for the month and comparing it to the month before and the month before that. It only takes a few minutes. So just uh, um, maybe spend a few more minutes. Yeah, two-minute phone call to Mike. I was exactly. just about to say, yeah. I could pretty much call yeah. it her team to yeah. kind of figure out or ask any questions. I probably, that's that's have, the thing, right? too. If you pick, pull out a statement, that's what my team's here for. I probably have about 15 more, but I think I wasted too much time telling a story. So I'm sorry, everybody, that I told that story <laughs> instead of giving you more tips. I think. Uh, Absolutely you know, not. Yeah. So. You're good. So I want to go ahead and just thank everybody for attending today. And I want to thank you guys for coming here and spending some time with Welcome. me and fun. sharing your knowledge with everybody. Um, I want to keep you guys updated. We do have another Coffee Talk coming up on June 13th, so do not hesitate and sign up for that. That's going to be with Benny Pollard, and that's going to be on Crushing the Competition. We'll talk a little bit about marketing and branding. I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Take care.